Today, uh, the webinar, we are going to go over the newest sequencer in the Illumina product fleet, the MiniSeq. Um, I am going to, basically this is going to be a high level overview of the system. We're not going to go down into the technical nitty gritty, but uh, we're going to go over an overview of the system. We're going to talk about how to set up a run on the MiniSeq, how to start the run, how to monitor the run, and a new software package uh, that was introduced with the MiniC called Local Run Manager and what analysis options are available on this platform. So that being said, uh, the MiniC sequencing, it's a very simple system. It's a self-contained sequencer. Uh, it is uh, relatively small. It is a 90, it's, it's a benchtop sequencer. It has a small footprint, weighs about 90 pounds, and it's also relatively affordable. It is, the retail price on it is under $50,000, uh, and it's a self-contained system. It integrates cluster generation, sequencing, and data analysis all in a self-contained unit. Uh, it's very easy to use. It, the control software has a streamlined workflow for run setup, uh, uh, system, system um, options, things like that. It's, it's very streamlined workflow, and it has very fast, it's a very fast sequencer. It has fast data output. The longest supported run is completed in less than 24 hours on this. Uh, and it is also compatible with Base Space Sequencing Hub. It's, uh, and Base Space, we'll go into those details a bit later, uh, but it's easy to transfer or share your runs with your colleagues using this technology. So that being said, we're gonna talk about the performance specifications. So currently, there are two versions of the reagent cartridges available on the MiniSeq. There's the high output and the mid output. The high output cartridges come in three different cycle sizes, 300, 150, and 75. Now the gigabase output, the gigabase output that we are expecting uh, for a high output run is about 7.5 gigabase, and uh, the shorter cycle cartridges support lower gigabase output. We expect greater than 80% Q30 quality scores on sequencing reads with our high output kits, and 85% with the shorter runs. The number of reads we're expecting is about 25 million reads for a single read. Of course, it's double that for a paired end read. And the longest run, and this includes um, uh, paired end and in dual indexing and uh, the cluster generation, the turnaround chemistry, all of that, about 24 hours. So this is a very, very fast instrument. The mid output kit comes in one size, a 300 cycle kit, and you get about 2.4 gigabase output, and we expect 80% or greater quality uh, Q30 scores. Number of reads, of course, since it's a, a smaller output kit, uh, 8 million reads for single read and 16 million for paired end, and a run is complete in about 18 hours. So these times, uh, that includes everything, as I mentioned, cluster generation, sequencing, base calling, paired end chemistry, all of that. Uh, the Q30 score, this is average over the entire run. So this is what we'd expect at the end of a run for a successful run, greater than 80 or 85%, depending on the size of the cartridge you're using. Now all the kits, they're kitted by cycle number. They are overfilled by plus 18 cycles. So for example, by that a 300 cycle kit actually has 318 cycles uh, worth of reagent uh, packaged with it. And the reason for that is that that supports dual indexing. So if you have two eight base indexing uh, two eight base index reads, you have plus two cycles left over. Then it's usually best practice not to push it to the very last cycle. That prevents incorporating bubbles or such during the chemistry. Now, the supported total cluster density is very similar. Uh, if any listeners out there are familiar with the NextSeq platform, you're gonna see a lot of familiarity with this uh, because it uses very similar technologies. The total supported cluster density is 160 to 220,000 per square millimeter. That is a, that has been validated using a control FIX library, so a well-based, diverse library. This type of cluster density is what we would recommend. So a quick summary of the sequencing technologies, the chemistry. The MiniSeq uses the same SBS chemistry as the NextSeq, and that's called two-channel SBS chemistry. And it's very similar to the NextSeq system. Uh, just a quick overview of what that is. The, uh, the nucleotides are labeled with red and green fluorophores, two channels. So the C are labeled with red, the T are labeled with green, the A is mixed both red and green, so it produces a, an orange color, and the G does not have a fluorophore, fluorophore label. So what this does is that the instrument will scan the base calls on a scatter plot, 
and will group the fluorescence that it sees in centroids and make a base call depending on that, as you can see by the little graph there. There is a link in this presentation if you want to know more about how SBS chemistry works, and there's a link down there. I uh, invite you to go and check it out. The optic system, it is a single optical module, and that includes the mirrors, the, the lenses, uh, the objective lenses, and the camera. So it's a single camera system. It has a focusing system like the Nexeek is that it uses a laser diode to help focus on the flow cell. So it's a very simplified system compared to the Nexeek. The fluidics, it has a single improved valve and a single pump system. The flow cell, it has a single lane. And the geometry of the flow cell is very similar to the MySeq flow cell for MySeq users out there. So the, we'll have a picture of it a little bit later, but the flow cell is very similar to the MySeq. And the reagent cartridge, it's one large cartridge. All your reagents in order to do a run are consolidated on this single cartridge. So you have a template, your sample loading position. You have uh, wells containing all the enzymes and buffers that are needed to do SPS chemistry. And it also has all the primers in order to support dual indexing. So next, let's go over how do you set up a run on the MiniSeq. So generally, this is a sequencing workflow. Uh, you prepare your libraries, you sequence your libraries, you analyze your data, and then share your data with your, your collaborators. So in order to prepare a library, you're going to choose a library prep kit and perform quality control on those libraries after the prep, and then you're going to set up the, the MiniSeq run. Now, this four hours hands-on time, six hours prep, library prep time, this is this is just a representative of like the TrueSeq custom Amplicon assuming paired in 150 sequencing. Now, what, not sure what kind of kit to use. We have a tool on our website called the Prep and Array Kit Selector. Uh, this is a very powerful tool. If you want to know what is the appropriate kit and which sequencer support that kit, uh, and uh, I invite you to explore this option as well. This is a really excellent tool. So setting up the run on the MiniSeq, this depends entirely on what type of analysis configuration you want to do. So the analysis configuration is determined by settings in the MiniSeq control software. And there are technically four options here. You can support base-based sequence hub. So the MiniSeq is completely compatible with our cloud analysis solution, base-based sequence hub. It also supports base-based on-site, the low throughput version. So if you have a uh, base-based on-site, uh, the MiniSeq is supported on the low throughput version. Now this is very similar to the support as it is on the NextSeq. There is a new analysis option introduced with the MiniSeq. It's called Local Run Manager. And so your sample information, your run parameters, all this information you use local run manager to set your run up. And this is more of a self-contained option. And for those of you who have third-party analysis options or any uh, custom downstream uh, um, uses for FASTQ files, there is an option to do standalone mode. And in standalone mode, you use the control software to set up your run parameters. So let's talk about how do you set up the run on the MiniSeq. So this is how you start the run. So sequencing, 300 cycle run takes less than 24 hours to complete, and it takes about 10 minutes of hands-on time to set up the run. Very easy, very intuitive, and the control software work, uh, walks you through each of the steps. So in a general, in a, in a general scheme, you're going to denature and dilute your libraries. So you're going to create single-stranded uh, uh, single-stranded molecules. You're going to prepare your reagent cartridge. You're going to thought, you're going to, you're going to mix it, and you're going to get it prepared to load on the instrument. You're also going to prepare your flow cell. There's a uh, specific method to do this. You're going to load your libraries on the reagent cartridge at a dedicated position on the cartridge and load it and start your run. So let's go over some of the denature and dilute library steps. The MiniSeq has a Denature and Dilute Libraries Guide, and that provides protocols for preparing the libraries, and it has two workflows, one for manually normalized or bead-based normalized libraries. And it also describes how to prepare your PhiX control. Your target cluster density, as previously mentioned, you want 160 to 220K. So the MiniSeq, the denaturing and diluting your libraries, we use, we've incorporated a TRIS uh, a pH 7 tris hydrochloride. 
uh, solution, and this is to, hydrolyze, to ensure that that sodium hydroxide you're using to denature your library is fully hydro, uh, hydrolyzed. You're going to dil dilute and would take, I'm sorry, dilute the denatured library with your PhiX. You're going to bring, the loading concentration is 1.8 picomolar. You're going to mix your sample library and your PhiX control on a volumetric basis, and the total loading volume is going to be 0.5 milliliters. So a half milliliter of your denatured and diluted sample is going to be loaded on the reagent cartridge. Preparing the reagent cartridge. Here's a little cartoon of what the cartridge looks like. You will remove, the, the cartridge comes in a, a uh, wrap, you're going to remove the wrap, and then you're going to float the reagent cartridge in a room temperature water bath, and it takes about 90 minutes. Some of the wells on the reagent cartridge have a fairly large volume, so it does take some time. Uh, so you're going to thaw it in this water temperature, or in the room temperature water bath, making sure that the water doesn't in, in, ingress over the top of the uh, lower lid edge. And then you're going to, you know, visually inspect the wells to make sure that everything is fully thawed, that you don't have little icebergs floating in there. After everything's thawed, you're going to manually and gently invert the cartridge five times. It is very, very important that the reagents are mixed thoroughly because uh, you can have a, a suffer run performance issues if uh, this is not done. Afterwards, you're going to tap the cartridge in a hard surface. And the reason is, is you want to remove bubbles. You want to settle the reagents and we want to dislodge any water that is on the base of the, or a base of the cartridge. Now, this is very important because the instrument has sippers that come down into these reagent positions, and if there's a bubble stuck to the side of the well or one at the bottom of the well, and if it tries to deliver that reagent and pulls air instead, you can have a, a, a run failure. So it's very important to thoroughly mix, tap everything, bring the reagents down to the bottom, and dislodge any air bubbles. And also important, you want to take like paper towels and dry the base of the cartridge because you're going to be sliding this into the instrument and uh, the uh, container that holds the reagent cartridge. If you have a lot of water ingress in there, you don't want to, it might encourage a mold growth. So you want to make sure it's, it's reasonably dry before you insert it. And then you run the cartridge and your run takes less than 24 hours. How to prepare the flow cell. So the flow cell is packed dry inside a little tube, as you see in this cartoon here. And that tube has a little uh, package of desiccant to help keep it dry. And that tube is shipped in a sealed mylar pouch. So you're going to remove the pouch from the refrigerator. The flow cells are stored at four degrees. You're going to remove it from the refrigerator and just set the package on a tabletop at room temperature for 30 minutes. That is going to normalize the temperature inside that package, and that's very important because we don't want to encourage any type of condensation on the glass of the flow cell. So as I mentioned, it's shipped dry within a, in the foil pack. So what, after this 30 minutes, you remove the flow cell container from the foil pack, so you open the foil pack. Remove the flow cell, and then you remove the flow cell cartridge from the container. And then you can use your fingers to do this, just make sure they are gloved. You're going to prep the surface, the glass area of the flow cell, so you're going to clean it with a lint-free alcohol wipe and then a lint-free cloth to make sure it's thoroughly dry, and then uh, and dry with a lint-free tissue or lens paper. It's very important. Once the foil packaging is opening, or it's opened, uh, the timer is set. You must use that flow cell within the next 24 hours else you will have a quality degradation of that. After you've cleaned the flow cell, very important, you want to inspect it. You want to make sure that it, the gasket is well seated, and you want to make sure that the flow cell port, uh, check the ports here, make sure that there aren't any obstructions. So the easiest way to do this, and this is the cartoon of the flow cell, it has a plastic uh, sleeve and then a, and a glass area there, and you can see the lane. It's kind of fat in one end and the exit port on the other, uh, single lane. But that little black gasket there, you want to make sure that it is flush with that plastic surface. You want to make sure it doesn't have any flashing, anything obstructing the holes, because this is where your reagents will flow through the flow cell. So you want to make sure that it is it is an, it's healthy. Also, you want to observe, you know, make sure there's no scratches. You want to make sure there's no lint on the surface because that, that fat area of the lane is where the instrument will do the imaging of your clusters. And you want to make sure that the, the flow cell looks, looks healthy. So free of obstructions, 
and make sure the flow cells. I, I can't stress this enough. Always give a thorough inspection of your flow cells to remove it. it. It will save you a lot of headache down the road. So at this point, you have your denatured and your diluted libraries. You're going to load your sample at the highlighted position on the reagent cartridge. There's a little cartoon here. The way you're going to prep this is that all these wells are sealed with a foil. Uh, and it's a, it's a fairly beefy foil uh, to protect the reagents inside. What you're going to want to do is you're going to take a, a alcohol prep pad and where it says load library here, you're going to clean that. Clean that area, make sure there's no water droplets on top of it, no condensates. Clean it off and then dry it out, make sure that it's fully clean and dry. And then you take, you pre-pierce the foil, just take a P1000 pipette tip and pre-pierce that foil location. And after that, you can use a P1000 tip to load your half milliliter of prepared library. Good bench technique here is very critical as well because you do not want to introduce air or bubbles to this reagent position. Um, so practice pipetting in, make sure there's no bubbles trapped. You can visually inspect on the bottom, of course, uh, and make sure all your reagent is delivered to the bottom of the reagent position. So avoid air bubbles and be careful with your pipetting and accurate with your pipetting. And lastly, you're going to start the control run. So you, you put your cartridge inside the instrument, you load your flow cell, and at that point, you go to the control software. So how you start the run is going to depend on what analysis configuration you had previously chosen. So if you have chosen base space or base space on site, you're going to be, uh, when you log into the control software, it's going to ask for your base space credentials to log in. And then you will, uh, of course, you want to uh, prepare your, your run with the same base space account that you log into with the control software, else you won't see it on the list. But if you log in, you will see your runs ready to sequence on that list. And also, the sim it's similar with local run manager. If you select local run manager, the control software asks you to log in with your local run manager credentials, and then you will see your list of runs ready to, uh, ready to go. So here's a little breakdown of the runtime. Uh, after you press start, the instrument starts sequencing. It takes approximately 90 minutes for cluster generation. After that, it's about four minutes per cycle. So it's a very, very fast instrument. The sequencing cycle is four minutes. If you're doing paired end chemistry, paired end, a paired end run, it takes about an hour to do the paired end chemistry. So what that does is that that flips all the molecules and the clusters on their head and does reverse complement sequencing, your reverse sequencing. At the end of the run, when it's all complete, the instrument will automatically do a post run wash. And that post run wash takes about 75 minutes. And that, that wash is done with reagents that are preloaded on the reagent cartridge. So I just want to do a little uh, a quick overview of dual indexing on the, on the mini-seq. Now, those of you familiar with our legacy sequencers, the high-seq and the my-seq, it's a little bit different than that. And then those are four-channel chemistry. With this, uh, and this is, this is true for the next seq as well, is that you have your read one. So you have BP10 that's loaded on the cartridge. It will hybridize to your clusters, and then you will go through read one sequencing. So it'll read through your DNA insert. After that, the polynucleotide chains are uh, stripped off, and then you have BP14, your I7, your first index read. That primer is hybridized, and it reads your first index. Now, this is where the parts from our legacy instruments is that Paired end turnaround chemistry occurs before your second index read. So it will go through paired end turnaround chemistry and then use that BP14 primer cocktail, which also contains the primer for the I5 or your second index read, and then your second index read. It's a little, it, that is reverse on our older systems, where uh, the second index read, there are dark cycles, and then it will read your second index, and then it goes through turnaround chemistry. So those, those are you experienced users out there. Please keep this in mind. A little bit, the, the, the sequence of things are a little different on the mini C. Um, and after that, you get your reverse read. Your, it's called read two on this uh, diagram, but uh, the BP11 primer loaded on the cartridge, that's your read two primer, and then you get your, your reverse read. BP14, it's a mixed index primer cocktail. So it has two primers in there. They are physical primers and a physical primer for the I7 and the I5 index reads. So because paired end, when paired end turnaround occurs, the mini seq, if you're doing a single read dual indexing run, it still has to go through turnaround chemistry. So it will go through the paired end turnaround and do the second index reads. At the end of the run, 
there are post-run procedures. Oh, actually, let me back up one moment. When you start your run, you're setting up your run. Before you start, uh, before you press sequence, the instrument will go through some pre-run checks, and it's just some, you know, make sure that the cameras are talking with the control software, ensures that the fluidic, the fluidics are working, and every, uh, just pre-run checks, make sure everything is talking correctly with the system. After that, it will start the run. So, post-run procedures. At the end of the run, uh, what will happen is that you will have an optional reagent purge, and what this does is that any leftover reagents in the reagent cartridge, this purge will force all of those to the waste bottle. Uh, so that's more of a convenience. Uh, at the end of the run, an automatic post-run wash is performed. It takes about 75 minutes, and it uses wash reagents and sodium hypochlorite reagents that are preloaded on the reagent cartridge. You don't have to add anything to the cartridge, and you don't have to do anything to do this. It will automatic, at the end of this successful run, it will uh, go through this procedure. Position number nine of the reagent cartridge, it contains formamide, that's a denaturant. Uh, that is usually considered a hazmat material, and of course that will be dictated by your own uh, environmental health and safety, so you should consult them for guidance, but Illumina has made the cartridges so you can remove that individual position from the cartridge, so you don't have to uh, throw the entire reagent cartridge into the hazmat disposal. You can remove just that position and uh, any void volume that is still there, uh, you can just both of it properly. And it just has a breakaway tab and a little reservoir clip, and it's very easy to actually pop out. So that, that too, is a, is a uh, convenience of the cartridge. There are also manual wash options. Now, these are apart from the automatic post-run wash. That does not need your input. That is done at the end of a successful run. But you can do a manual post-run wash, and you have the option to do a quick wash. Now, the quick wash takes about 20 minutes, and, and this, this is a, a screenshot from the control software from the wash selection. Quick wash is about 20 minutes, and what it does is it flushes the system with a wash buffer. Basically, it's a, a tween solution that you prepare. This is required on the instrument every seven days as normal maintenance. So if the instrument has been idle for seven days, it will ask you to do a, a quick wash before it will allow you to set up a new run. Now, the manual post-run wash, uh, the protocol is identical to the automatic post-run wash. It takes about 75 minutes. However, in this case, you're using the wash tray, and you are loading it with your sodium hypochlorite and your, your tween wash solution. So this is done if a run was interrupted or a run failed, where, or if the control software crashes, something like that, where the automatic post-run wash is not complete, you're going to need to do this in order to um, uh, put the instrument back into service. So you have these two manual wash options. I just want to quickly show you what that looks like. This is the wash cartridge. Uh, it's a, a mock-up the reagent cartridge. The B position is going to contain your wash solution, and that's a dilute tween solution. And that A position there is where you load 0.12% sodium hypochlorite. The manual post-run wash, you load your hypochlorite. And position B, you load 0.05% tween. And these, here are the volumes. And for the quick wash, you do not need uh, sodium hypochlorite for a quick wash, only that tween and 40 mils loaded at that uh, B position. Very, very critical if you're doing a manual post-run wash, always use a fresh solution of hypochlorite made within the last 24 stored at 4 degrees. Hypochlorite is not a real stable chemical, and it's critical uh, that uh, fresh hypochlorite is used on the system. We do not uh, recommend you use commercial grade uh, sodium hypochlorite, like a, like a bottle of Clorox. You don't, you don't want lavender scented mini seek. And also commercial, uh, commercial preparations of bleach are very often the percentage on their active ingredient. Very often those are inaccurate. Uh, so we recommend using a lab grade sodium hypochlorite source. Those are much more reliable and much more consistent. So I'm going to talk about some uh, diagnostic tools that are built into the instrument. These are called system checks. So these are onboard system diagnostic tests. You do not have to do these as normal procedure. Uh, generally, these are used for troubleshooting, and a member of tech support will usually instruct you to perform one or more of these tests. And, uh, and, it, and let me stress, it's not required for normal operation or system maintenance. Now, the way it works is that there is a manage instrument button in the control software, and you'll select system check from that list. 
And what will happen is that you'll have a dialog box that pops open, it warns you it's going to close the control software, and then it will open the service software. And this is software that is installed on the Mini-C. It will close the control software, open the, open the service software, and then what you're going to do is you're going to load consumables. Uh, basically, you're a wash flow cell and your wash cartridge. So it says use trusted wash flow or use trusted flow cell. This is a flow cell that like an old experimental flow cell. You want to use one that you use that has been successful for us. So a successful run old experimental flow cell, you can reserve that and use that as your wash flow cell. And that's what we mean by trusted. One that's been sitting on a bench for a long time, it's gotten dusty, may have some salt crystals in it. That's one you don't want to use for this type of ass or this type of test. And your wash cartridge, it says load tween or lab grade water. Water is perfectly fine. You're going to load it at that wash position. And you're going to empty the spent reagents bottle. And this is just a Nalgene bottle inside the instrument that you can uh, disp discard the, the waste, waste liquids. And then you have your option to select which test to run. If you did the entire suite of tests, I'm sorry, something popped up on my screen there. Uh, if you do the entire suite of tests, uh, it takes about 20 minutes total and it will generate a report. Automatically, we'll store the report at this location on the drive, but it also gives you the option to save the report in a place of your choice. So when dealing with tech support, we will, when you run these system checks, we're going to want to get that zipped report in order to analyze what might have gone wrong. So let's go over some more of the detail of system checks. So there are, uh, there's four columns. There's the motion test, the optics test, fluidics, and thermal test. Now you'll see there are three tests on the optics column that are grayed out. These require a specialized flow cell, and those are usually performed by our field service engineers. Uh, so you will never need to run those tests. So you can select by the check boxes which ones to run. And then you, correct, you click next, and then you will get a progress. You'll have like a little uh, circular icon when it's in, in progress, and when it passes, you'll have a green check mark by it. So I won't go into details of what these tests do, but um, like the, the fan mechanical, these, this, test, um, this test that the flow cell loading mechanism is working correctly and that the, autom uh, the fluidics autom automation module is working correctly. Uh, stage test will test the travel limits and performance of uh, the, the flow cell, XY stage, uh, Z stage. Registration, make sure the instrument can uh, tilt the flow cell on the correct optical plane, test the camera functionality. There's a lot of different things that are done here, uh, but tech support will guide you on what to do and will, uh, you know, depending on what the troubleshooting pathway is taking us. So best practices, write these down. <laughs> these are very important. We highly, highly recommend uh, these procedures. When you are loading the reagents, be patient. Some, there's RFID chips on the reagent cartridge and the flow cell that the instrument has a reader for. And sometimes when you load a cartridge, it may take a few seconds until it registers. It's not always automatic. So be patient. Empty the spent reagents cartridge, uh, or I'm sorry, spent reagents bottle, I should say bottle, before each run. Uh, simple matter of just removing it from its contain, uh, compartment, dumping it into your waste stream, and placing the bottle back. So get in the habit of always emptying it. Keep your wash cartridge clean. After it's cleaned out, make sure it's inverted on some paper towels. You don't want to encourage mold growth in uh, the, in the um, part that you're using to clean your instrument. At the end of the run, leave the used flow cell in the reagent cartridge on the instrument until your next run. And the reason for this is that that seals the system, the fluidic system, from the environment. So with temperature changes, atmospheric pressure changes, that over time, that might force air into the fluidics, and we want to avoid that if we can. You want to save your run data to a network or to base space, and what we mean by that is we don't want to, you don't leave your old runs on the uh, PC drive for long, it's not intended as long-term storage. You want to do file maintenance, of course, when, the, when a run is not in progress, but you want to do file maintenance, archive your old run folders, just don't use the instrument as long-term storage. Also because that hogs disk space and the instrument does need scratch disk space in order to conduct certain types of runs. And it's also best to leave the instrument on at all times, even when it's not used. And the reason for that is the same as for leaving the spent reagents on, is that with the instrument on, the instrument has positive control of the pumps and the 
that pumps in all the fluidics, so it reduces the chance of air ingress into the system. And lastly, uh, those of you who have called tech support before, you probably recognize this, periodically power cycle the system. The system has a PC, Windows, ba Windows 7 based PC, that speaks with other computer components on the instrument and the instrumentation hardware. Periodic, any computer that's left on for a long period of time can kind of just go into a little unstable state. Periodically, power cycling the system refreshes all that, loads the software fresh in the memory and initializes the system so this, the control software is properly talking with all the instrument hardware. Period, we don't have a recommendation on a, on a uh, frequency of this, but it's be, don't leave your instrument on for like a long, long period of time and then set up a run without power cycling. It's usually best practice to power, periodically power cycle. Okay, so monitoring your run on the Mini-Seq. You have essentially three options. The Mini-Seq control software has a kind of a minimal run monitoring. It's a real-time run monitoring. You can get information like cluster density. I'll go over that in just a moment. Um, you can monitor on instrument analysis and you get your intensities and your quality scores. If you set up the run as a base space run, you would use base space for run monitoring, and there's a lot more detail that is available in base space. And also our software called Sequencing Analysis Viewer. This is software we use to do QC for run quality, and that too has very analogous function as base space. That allows you to run, monitor your run in greater detail. So here's a picture of the sequencing uh, screen. This is when a run is in progress, this is what you will see. So uh, point A here, this is run progress, and this is a progress bar. This will show you clustering phase, read, pair in turnaround, index reads, and then the wash. So you can monitor where the run is, and often we will ask you this, where is the run, what's the progress of the run when, when you talk to us at tech support. Uh, position B, that is reported Q scores, and that's the cumulative report of the Q scores. C is reported at uh, intensity. Now. On our, some of our instruments and base space and the sequence analysis viewer, uh, intensity scores are usually reported after cycle, it depends on the instrument, but usually anywhere between cycle five and seven. On, in the Mini-C control software, that re, it is not reported until cycle 25. So your quality scores and your intensity scores don't appear until after sometime soon after cycle five. So don't be alarmed if you're cycle 12 or so and you don't see any intensity scores in the control software interface. That's normal. So after cycle five, you get your cluster density information. Your cluster map has been prepared and it's been registered and it has an idea what the raw cluster density is. You have your clusters passing filter. Clusters used for uh, actually generating your data. These are pass a quality screen and that's a percentage of the total clusters. Uh, that are used to generate your data. You get an estimated yield in gigabase of what the run is going to do or produce for you and data transfer status. So this icon changes depending on the uh, data transfer and that's based of course on the analysis configuration. And lastly, time to completion. This tells you when it expects to run to complete. Uh, this is kind of a learning. Uh, the instrument will learn. So your very first run, this completion estimate is usually pretty inaccurate, but on your subsequent runs, it learns and it gets much more accurate. So it takes about three or four runs until it gives you a better estimate of when the run completed. So don't be alarmed if your first run is not complete when it says it's going to be complete, but your later runs will be. So sequence analysis viewer. So this is what we recommend. This is Illumina software we use for uh, monitoring runs and looking at the quality control. So there are three files inside the run folder that SAV uses, the run info, run parameters, and the interop folder. These three files are what's the minimum required in order to view an SAV. And the information availability in SAV, intensities in your cluster density appear after cycle five your phasing and pre-phasing values after cycle 25, and these are, these are a measure of how well the chemistry is proceeding. Your clusters passing filters report after cycle 25, your quality scores after cycle 25, and your PHI-X alignment and your error rates, those are usually reported about cycle 26 and onwards. So here's a screenshot of what sequence analysis viewer looks like with a mini-seq high output flow cell. Uh, the gray tiles, you'll see, notice the gray, uh, gray tiles up there, that's normal. That's because of the geometry of the flow cell. Those tiles are not used for imaging. 
Uh, and you can see you have your, your, your data by cycle. Those of you familiar with SAV, you should be very familiar with this interface, but this is the software. New users out there, if you're new to our uh, technology, become very familiar with SAV. Uh, it's a very powerful software tool to help you analyze your run. So run monitoring. The metrics can be viewed on the instrument during the run. So like I said, the control software interface, you get your intensity, cluster density, and your Q scores. Those all appear after about cycle 25. The run metrics can be viewed remotely through SAV. You just point SAV to the run uh, the, the run folder on the MiniSeq, and that can be viewed in real time. Uh, you can, during a run or after the run is completed, and it provides a lot more information than the control software. Uh, in SAV, metrics are reported, your intensity and cluster density are reported at cycle five, but cycle 25 and onward, you get your other metrics, pass filter, your estimated yield, quality scores, and phasing, prephasing. So, Absolute or relative values for run metrics are dependent on the type of library. Now, what this means is that different library types can produce different results in run quality. Low diversity samples can produce some alarming run metrics, but that is to be expected. So it will be a, trend, a trending for those run metrics is recommended to ident identify any of those outliers. So if you have a library type that you regular, regularly sequence, you're going to be familiar with what that, that trending is. And if you see an outlier, that, that's a red flag for you to call tech support and have us take a look at it. And lastly, I want to go over local run manager and the analysis options. So analyze data, local run manager, and base space are your options. They are standalone. We're not going to go too much into that. I really want to go over local run managers since that's new software. So local run manager, it provides an on-instrument integrated solution. It, it, you can create your run, you can execute your run, you can anal, uh, view your results and analyze the sequencing data. It also incorporates some user management. So it has like account, uh, account management tools for a lab with multiple users. So it's, it's an all-in-one uh, on-instrument integrated solution. Now I stress local run manager is only on, on the MiniSeq. It is not currently available for, as standalone. So uh, those of you familiar with MySeq Reporter, it does have a standalone option. That's not true. Local run manager is on the MiniSeq only. So local run manager is viewed through a web browser interface. The MiniSeq is provided with Chromium, and that is a open source version of Chrome. Uh, if you wish to install Chrome on the MiniSeq, it is okay to do such, and it is compatible with Local Run Manager. Local Run Manager runs as a system service. It's accessed in the address bar in the web browser window. You just go to HTTP colon forward slash forward slash localhost. There's no port number required. Uh, it's instrument, uh, instrument monitor. It, I mentioned Chromium all already. Local Run Manager installed on the instrument has a single pre-installed account, and this is this default admin account. It's called admin, and the default password is password. Users are encouraged to create their own admin account and set up their own accounts as appropriate. Um, so to create users, you, you can refer to the Local Run Manager software guide. You can create um, admin users, uh, standard users, and I'll go into more detail, a little bit more in just a moment. And the next slide, as a matter of fact. So user roles. You can create admin user or regular users. Now, the admin, as you would serve MISE, has all the permissions. You can manage user accounts, edit system settings, view audit trails, and the audit trails are, are basically it's just a log of how the, who's logging into the instrument, how the instrument is used, uh, and so forth. Uh, it's just a management tool. Uh, uh, Requeuing analysis, edit module settings, or add library prep kits. You have the option to create a custom library kit and local run manager. So admin can do all this. User default, they cannot manage user accounts, edit system settings, or view audit trails. However, they can be opted into being allowed to do requeue analysis or, and the other functions here. That's accessed in the local run manager uh, window here at the little gear icon. You see down there at the bottom, user management. So you create users, you set a temporary password and you create a new account. Uh, first time that user it logs in, they will be asked to create a, you know, a custom password for themselves, uh, set and edit the role and permissions. You can reset passwords and you, admin accounts can also unlock locked user accounts. So if a password attempt is done wrong too many times, that account may be locked. It will require an admin account to unlock that account. 
Now, if by bad chance uh, you lock out your admin account and it's the only account, uh, we do have a tool in tech support. We would be able to reset that for you. So system settings or security, you can set a password expiration date. Uh, we, and also a user lockout. So login attempts before lockout. This is a security feature. We recommend that you set this to a higher number for most labs, just because if you type in the password wrong, you might lock out the account. It's a little inconvenient. So set that number to a higher, higher time. Um, password reset reminder, you can customize that and auto lockout. The instrument is idle, it will automatically lock out uh, local run manager, or um, I should say log off local run manager. So we also have maintenance. There's a ma under system settings, there's a maintenance tab. So what maintenance does, there's delete system analysis folder. What this does is that temporary files by default are not removed from the instrument. So when you set up a run, you have your, your local run folder, and that's in the mini seek sequencing temp folder. So what happens is that when you set up a new run, those old runs will persist there. And if they're not periodically cleared out, it will hog this space. So what this does is that you can set up the instrument to automatically delete the, those local uh, run folders automatically. So it's kind of an automated uh, system maintenance for you. And you know, that can be turned on and off depending on what you require. And database backup. This is database stores user info, the audit trails. This is information that would be if the instrument has uh, the local L, uh, <coughs> excuse me local run manager needs to be reinstalled. This information can be saved and retained and then put back in that case. It does not back up your sequencing run data. Uh, this is just for instrument maintenance only. So creating a run. So if you select local run manager as analysis option, you'll use it to set up your run settings. Uh, you will select the kit, the index reads and sequencing settings here in the first red box. So you'll select which library prep kit you want, number of index reads and other run parameters. You also see check boxes for custom primers if you so desire. Now down below you will, uh, it, depending on the library prep kit you select, you will have the option of which module uh, uh, module you're using. There's Depending on the module selected, there are specific settings for that module and that will depend. So we'll create FASTQ only, you're not gonna have any specific settings there. And in the third box down there, this is kind of like experiment manager on the MySeq for setting up a sample sheet. You will use this to enter your sample information. So you'll add your sample, the ID, the index from a dropdown, a manifest if required. You can add and remove rows. Okay, so after this, uh, this is the home screen of the MiniSeq, and you'll, when you press the sequence button, it'll ask you to log in the local run manager, and then it'll show your runs ready to sequence on that list there. And analyzing sequencing data. When the sequencing completes, local run manager will automatically go into analysis mode. So we'll an analyze that data depending on what your selected workflow. These are the analysis modules. These modules are uh, they can be installed, they're a regular Windows installer, they can be installed or removed depending on what the user desires. Uh, there are currently eight analysis modules here, and those are the list of them. Example of the workflow is after, an, when analysis mode kicks in, uh, demultiplex, so it's going to sort your reads depending on the index information. It's gonna generate FASTQ files, and then depending on the workflow, it's going to align those FASTQs to a reference or a manifest, and then it's going to do variant calling. Okay, so viewing analysis results is within the local run manager window. You'll have three tabs here, a run overview and a sequencing information. What you see here, let's go over, okay, the, the three tabs for run overview, you'll have just basic information about your run. It will tell you if it's completed or not, analysis completed or not. It'll give you the total reads, reads past filter and other metrics. The sequencing information tab, that will tell you your run parameter setup. And other important thing, it will tell you which version of the analysis module you're using because newer versions will be independently released. You have the option to update those. Uh, so older analysis runs, if you, for example, if you installed version two of this particular module, uh, your older analysis modules, it will indicate that this was analyzed with version one and then your, your newer analysis will be using version two. And the third is your samples and results, and this is where your results will be. 
So it will show you a list of your samples, and then it will have a PDF report summary result for each of those samples. You can, this is a HTML report. The actual PDF lives inside the run folder, uh, so you can grab those there, but you can quickly view it in local run manager in, in an HTML report. Okay, uh, the analysis options. This is just a table showing uh, the local run manager module. It's analogous base space sequence hub app and what type of library kit that is supported here. I won't go over this, but this will be in the slide that we present to you later. Uh, but you can, uh, of course, go to the MiniSeq support website and that has a lot more information. I invite you to browse around there. And speaking of resources, we have the Local Run Manager software guide. Very important, understand how Local Run Manager works. This guide will help you. And then there are specific workflow guides depending. Uh, those are all available on our support site. And lastly, here's our resources. You can find various um, links to the MiniSeq kit information, the, the main support page. Uh, there's an on, various online courses and online videos uh, if you want to learn more about this technology, I highly recommend that you browse through there. Uh, I like to tell my customers that are new to these platforms that if they spend a couple hours going through these courses, reading the documentation and looking at these videos, they've already hurdled over 70% of the learning curve here. It's, our support resources are outstanding. Uh, the coverage calculator is, is provided as a link there, and the custom protocol, uh, I'm sorry, custom protocol selector is available. And with that, I uh, thank you for your time.